Teaching, Reason, and Theology Live. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael. We are going to be talking about priestly celibacy, joined by returning guest, Father Joseph Motlock, a Eastern Catholic priest. How are you, Father Joseph? Great to have you back on the show. I'm very well, thank you, Michael. How are you? Doing good. Um, wh where where did you say you're located right now? In, a, in an abbey? Right now, I am coming to you live from Belmont Abbey College in just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, um, as you can see by the Benedictine symbol uh, above my left shoulder. And your parish is also in North Carolina, correct? Yes, the parish at which I currently serve is in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's called St. Basil the Great. You seem to be a pretty pretty busy guy because I, I see you all over the place. So <laughs> it seems yes. like you wear multiple hats. <laughs> Every time I've come on your show, I've come on your show from different locations. Right. <laughs> Good stuff. And, and by the way, y'all um, uh, do the best that y'all can to ignore any background noise that you hear from my audio. It's about to rain really, really, really hard. And as y'all know, the studio here is not entirely soundproof so uh <laughs> but anyways let's let's move to the topic at hand and let's talk about priestly celibacy i'm really interested to hear your perspective on it i think that you actually did you write your dissertation on this i'm, I'm currently writing my dissertation my doctoral dissertation on the topic i was going to say it's ironic that you have me a married priest right speaking about it but i i suppose <laughs> ma priestly marriage and celibacy is probably what i would would speak on so both yeah so maybe introduce us to the topic and also this you know the the discipline i guess as it's in the west compared to the east or really any direction that you want to take it okay so, yes, I wrote my licentiate dissertation on the topic uh, when I was studying um, at Catholic University of America uh, with two priests who were actually on the dialogue between the Orthodox and uh, Catholic churches. One is on the North American dialogue, one was on the international dialogue. And ironically, as I was writing my licentiate dissertation, the North American Orthodox Catholic dialogue came out with uh, one of those statements on the issue of priestly celibacy and marriage. And if memory serves me correct, they actually recommended the overturning of cum data fuerit and, and all those other documents in the late 19th and early 20th century that forbade the ministry of married priests in, well, North America, South America, and Australia. And then of course, uh, very shortly thereafter, the, the Holy Father himself, uh, on page 400 and something of the Acta Apostolice Sedis, um, I guess, if you will, overturned that ban and clarified that uh, bishops, eparchial bishops and, and exarchates around the world, uh, outside of the so-called traditional territories, had the ability, uh, while consulting their brother Latin bishops, had the ability to ordain married candidates to the priesthood if they had a jurisdiction or a, a hierarchical structure in those territories. Uh, I may not be the very first, but I, I might be, or I might be one of the first priests ordained uh, with all of those restrictions fully lifted. I was ordained on October the 1st of 2015. I had a concelebrating Latin bishop just to prove the validity of my of my holy orders, but uh, there was no secrecy. It was just, uh, it was very um, normal fact of life. I was being ordained a married presbyter in one of the Eastern Catholic churches that had a jurisdiction here in, in North America. I'm originally from England, as you can probably tell, but here in North America to serve the churches here. So you didn't have to get permission from the Holy See or anything like that? I did not have to get permission from the Holy See because I followed, as I said, that, that permission mm -hmm. given by Pope Francis to, or that right. overturning of previous uh, restrictions by Pope Francis. Uh, despite the fact that there were married priests ministering beforehand, um, there was, if you will, no ambiguity about my legitimacy. And I joke about the Latin bishop, just to, just to prove that. <laughs> Both sides and, and, of the test. <laughs> And have you had any criticism since then, or have been have people been pretty receptive to your ordination? I would say most Catholics have been receptive to it mm -hmm. uh, for one reason or another. 
I occasionally count, encounter some criticism, and it could be from priests or from lay people. So from lay people, it, it comes across more as, how, how can this be possible? I thought mm -hmm. you were supposed to be married to the church or something like that. Mm -hmm. From priests, it's a little bit more um, academic or intellectual. Uh, it might sound like, well, you know, I accept you, you're my friend, but honestly, I believe in priestly celibacy and but but I accept you and we like you. <laughs> so so there's there's there is a, a cordial relationship, but sometimes you encounter, but but most people have been have been very receptive. Most people just unsure what to make of it. So they mm. grew up and they thought, well, I thought that this was not possible. How mm. is this possible? Um, how can you do this? And and then once you explain and catechize, I think then they're then they're a little more open. And then they get to know you on a personal level. They know you're not the devil. Um, <laughs> you're teaching them. You're teaching what the church teaches, and you you you're you're a priest, and you serve them. You mentioned being married to the church. I've I've heard some people say that actually, whenever you're a married priest, your first duty and obligation is to your wife rather than the church. Is that correct? Well, I, I would say the way that that those statements tend to be phrased tend to pit the one against the other. Yeah. Now, I try to to show this in in my in my work, which is intended to be, um, mm. I, I call it an irenic study. I'm not here to say that the, for example, that the Latins should change their discipline. I'm not here to state that. Um, in fact, I'm here merely to give theological witness to what we do as Eastern Christians. So I'm providing a positive explanation really an answer to all those lay people that asked me over the years, how is this possible? How, how theolo is this theologically possible? And one of the points I make, and, and some scholars I think have brought this up before me, is um, rather than saying, um, you know, I'm married to my wife, which then prevents me from being married to the church or vice versa, that um, in being married to my wife, I am in some sense imaging uh, iconifying, portraying my marriage to the church, because marriage in itself is an image of the union between Christ and the church, as we hear in Ephesians 5. And so rather than saying it's either this or this theologically, I'm trying to show how the one could be uh, an effective sacramental spiritual image of the other, so that in serving my wife, I am serving the church. And in serving the, the body of Christ over which I've been placed as a priest over a specific community, then my wife is included in that, in that movement. And it really came, it really struck me uh, one day when uh, my bishop was visiting and he was serving the divine liturgy and I was concelebrating with him. And, you know, as the antiphons were being sung, of course, not being a saint, my mind was wandering. And as my mind was wandering, my mind wandered over to see my wife leading uh, the second choir on the other side of the of the church. I had the, the male choir behind me, the women choir, the, the female choir on the other side, and sort of they were both uh, uh, doing the antiphonal liturgy. And I was standing to the right of the bishop, and I was looking at at her and, and the group that she was leading. And I immediately looked at the bishop, and I looked at myself vis-a-vis the bishop vis-a-vis -vis her and and the, of course the rest of the congregation and then it came time for the entrance the entrance into the altar and i as i entered behind the bishop into the kingdom i mean we're in the kingdom but i entered into the holy of holies it struck me at how out the processional nature of our liturgy the eschatological nature of our liturgy that entrance into the kingdom really came alive for me in that moment and as i saw my spouse uh, with whom I've been sacramentally united, as I saw her there in the body of Christ, um, which I was leading into the kingdom, well, of course, now behind my bishop, mm -hmm. I saw this congruence, this confluence, this, this fittingness of joining them as, as a whole. Um, I didn't see this tension. I, I didn't see a contradiction or theological, especially a theological contradiction in that. Mm -hmm. And and going into the kingdom together in order to live, to re celebrate and to receive the Eucharist and therefore to be in the kingdom, at, in, within the sacrament of the kingdom. And as I saw that, I thought to myself, then that, that's a, a, a wonderful way of explaining it, that there shouldn't be an either or, 
there is somehow a, a both and 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 you know I, I i know that in our byzantine tradition we have so many opportunities to join those things and i, I like that the very meaning of that word symbol to join those two realities together that there is that symbolic congruence there and that forms part of my explanation in in that uh, offering that eastern christian approach to the theology of how this could be without of course suggesting that the uh, that the latin tradition is somehow evil or wrong mm -hmm. I, i'm really trying to make a contribution from the eastern perspective yeah and, and i appreciate that i mean some so many people seem to go to an extreme where they condemn something <laughs> when it's not something that's condemnable you know i have a question and it is something that i've i've tried to get an answer to and i cannot find a very clear-cut answer perhaps because it's still in debate i don't know um but what is the case of um well when you have married clergy are they required to practice abstinence at all times or are they able to engage in the marital act at certain periods i've i've, I've heard different explanations there not only for priests uh, for priests but also for deacons and, and married deacons mm. this is a, a large question so bear with me and i'll try to answer it there are a number of ways i could tackle that mm. so i could tackle that simply from a contemporary canonical approach so what do the canons of the eastern catholic churches say well the canons are silent there is no canonical uh, line or prescription in the current canons that says uh, a priest must uh, be continent for X amount of time before the celebration of the sacred mysteries. It merely says in, in quite a beautiful way in the 1990 Code of Canons for the Eastern Churches that a priest is supposed to shine forth as an example of, of chastity for his people. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it approaches it from that positive point of view of the virtue this is what a priest is supposed to do of course mm -hmm. uh, virtue doesn't mean continence necessarily married persons can be virtuous mm -hmm. um, in practicing uh, chaste marriage okay so that's all it says historically there have been uh, various different um, prescriptions um, and and the four big authors of from the roman Catholic, the Latin Catholic uh, tradition in the 20th century that a lot of defenders of mandatory priestly celibacy as an apostolic phenomenon, they will tend to quote people like uh, Roman Choli, uh, Ukrainian Greek Catholic, ironically, um, Alphonse Stickler, Cardinal Stickler, uh, Kokini, and uh, Stefan Hyde. And they'll quote those, uh, those uh, vast majority canonists who are looking at what have the canons said throughout the ages. And so, yes, the canons have given various different things, mm -hmm. ranging from one night to sometimes 40 days. So mm. in some traditions and some churches, uh, clergy were required to abstain for 40 days before the Eucharist. So you can probably tell that they hardly celebrated the Eucharist uh, in comparison with, say, the daily mass of the Latin church. Um, and, and so, uh, now and then so what what does that mean and this is part of the debate is do those canons are they are they, are they was, was that was that the original uh, prescription and therefore we have to obey that or was that something that was later well of course in the mm -hmm. first few centuries of the church we don't have uh, laws that say you must do x what we do have is the new testament uh, that says um, and i know this is a very debatable point that the uh, the bishop and the presbyter, uh, they must be the husband of one wife. Mm. I realize that that phrase is hotly debated, mm. uh, whether it means he should be married, whether it means he should be married once and only once and not polygamous, or whether it means, and, and contemporary canonists of, of, of Latin Catholicism would say, well, that just means that he has to be continent, perpetually continent. So that's really uh, part of your question has to touch on that was it always understood that married priest that in as a condition to be ordained to the priesthood that a married man had to be perpetually continent mm. um, now latin can canonists of the last 40 50 years or so have argued that yes that was the case and that the eastern churches have innovated 
in mm-hmm. allowing for a married priest, married deacon, whatever, uh, to to practice his marriage, to to practice the conjugal act. Um, and therefore, because that's an innovation, they will argue that all of these later ideas of being continent for a day or whatever, three days, 40 days, that that was um, an innovation and a rupture. And they'll usually quote the council in Trullo as, an ex- as you know, the, the moment of rupture. But we got to this point now in, in, in the Catholic Church where the Orthodox churches would still, I believe, practice that. I can't say for certain what they do privately or whatever, but at least officially they would practice that. But for Eastern Catholics, there is no law. Uh, the law me is, is to be chaste. And that forms a part of my studies as well, is what can we understand about that? How, how can we interpret that? Um, as, as in, and, and, and to what extent are we required? To what extent is a married priest required in and of himself, in and of itself? Though, to what extent does the priesthood in itself require this continence? Or is this something that could be broadened, interpreted differently, understood differently? Um, yeah, so it's very hotly debated. But that gives you, I think, a very multi-layered answer to to your question. You know, I'm curious about the discipline that we find both for um, Latin Rite Catholics and Eastern Catholics. The discipline, to my knowledge, is, of course, that bishops would have to be um, unmarried. Um, I wonder why there's this practice of celibacy in the episcopate, um, but not necessarily for the presbyterate. You know, the, the arguments that would be used to say that you could have a married um, priest, why can't those arguments be applied to the Episcopate? So historically, there is evidence of bishops being married, the first being the, the New Testament itself. So the, the phrase, mia um, gynekos um, anir, uh, the husband of one wife, is also applied to, to bishops in the New Testament. So that tells you, you know, without interpreting it in any way that might prove a later case either for one way or the other that tells you that bishops were married they were they ordained married men to the episcopacy and then later on i think it was gregory of nessa i always get confused whether it's nazianzen or nessa but Mm. whose father was a married bishop Mm. and then there are other cases even centuries later where the bishops were married. Um, it's also true that um, an association between celibacy, or, yeah, celibacy and the episcopacy was much firmer earlier on. Even Justinian, you know, introduced mandatory, um, you know, uh, well, a bishop who was married had to you know, put away his wife to a monastery. And if she were very good, then she could get ordained a deaconess. Um, and then, but but again, scholars will point out that Sometimes these these things were slow in being implemented, even in the West, when the West introduces you know, celibacy for priests. I mean, we've had married priests right throughout that period, you know, even illegitimate, but whatever, it, it, it happened. So it shows you that this, this issue has been wrestled with back and forth. Um, the bishops, it's been a little more tranquil with that in terms of the apostolic churches. Um, the East, you know, ordains... Uh, uh, unmarried men to the episcopacy now, you know, monastics to the episcopacy. Um, I think that I, my studies focus on the presbyterate because really that's the issue. That's the, the big disagreement, if you will. I chose not to focus so much on the episcopacy. Mm. That needs its own studies, multiple studies. And I didn't, I didn't have the time or the, or the space mm. to do that. But that gives you an idea of how yeah. the episcopacy seems to be a little more settled, but even then not oh, 100%. The presbyterate is really where the wrestling match takes place. And just for clarification, I, I know they do in the Eastern Orthodox churches, but with Eastern Catholics, um, the bishops, are they also chosen from the monastic order? I mean, I think that is currently the practice. Scholars will point out that it's not necessarily the case, or even then they might disagree because there is this theological notion of a bishop is, again, wed to his diocese. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But other scholars will turn around and say, you know, there's no necessary association. So in theory, one could ordain a married man to the episcopacy. I mean, even in Latin canon law, if the Holy Father or an ecumenical council were to decide the discipline of celibacy could be made optional and married men could be ordained to Mm -hmm. the uh, presbyterate and even to the episcopacy in theory. It just seems like a, a bishop 
has a lot more territory to be concerned about than than a priest. Not that a priest doesn't have a lot to be concerned about, but it, it just seems like a, a bishop has so many more things that he has to address because it's a larger territory that he has oversight of. So I, I guess it, it makes sense that you would have that as far as a discipline compared to a priest who's usually dealing with just one parish. Although I, I understand some priests deal with four or five parishes sometimes well you know at one point in time i was the only priest serving south carolina and the whole of western north carolina mm. so my, my priest <laughs> jokingly called me the administrator of south carolina right <laughs> take it over again in the name of the queen right. <laughs> but so i had those territories but the difference between me and say my latin brother priests is my latin brother priests sometimes were in charge of mega mega parishes one mm. of them in charlotte has more parishioners than my entire eparchy, whereas wow. my communities were much smaller. And yes, even though I was serving two, maybe three parishes mm -hmm. uh, or, or small missions, they were very small. And the the smallness was conducive to more of a, I, I would call it an Acts of the Apostles kind of experience, where yes, I was the spiritual father, but I didn't have tens of thousands of faithful and families. I merely had you know, X amount of people that I would be in charge of and so, and then it enables my my bishop that yes, even though his territory was large, he was more. It was more of a sort of a personal approach that he was able to to be more of that spiritual shepherd rather than having tens of thousands of people. That my brother priest would say to me all the time, uh, "There's no way I can I can know them. I could get to know them. I might get to know a few yeah. daily mass goers, but I could never get to know all my sheep." Whereas me, I knew them all by name. Mm -hmm. I knew. I knew their struggles. I knew when they were sick. I knew when they were happy. Uh, so that smallness was was helpful. I've always appreciated those smaller uh, communities. It's it's so much more intimate, you know, than than some of these larger places where you just get lost and nobody would even know if you died. You know, it's just your your presence doesn't necessarily uh, stick out. And so, um, you you mentioned there. Um, the West, I, th I forget the exact words you used, but uh, it was something to the effect of introducing mandatory uh, celibacy in, in, in the West. When was that? Do we know mm -hmm. um, when, when the West introduced that discipline? Yeah, the, the, the Second Lateran Council. So even scholars advocating for what they would call the apostolic origins of, of mandatory priestly celibacy, I'm, I'm saying these, each one of these words is very important. The yeah. apostolic origins of mandatory priestly celibacy. Uh, nevertheless, we'll, we'll, we'll make a distinction between uh, continence and celibacy. So they will admit that the Western church was ordaining married men in the earliest centuries, but that the expectation was that they be perpetually con continent. So, um, um, and that's really the issue. And that's where sort of they would argue, well, um, this is where the ideal is clearly celibacy and therefore continence is, is in view of celibacy so that when celibacy was later introduced at, at that Lateran Council, it was just sort of a natural progression, almost like a development of doctrine kind of thing, sort of a natural mm -hmm. progression mm -hmm. into it. And there are, you know, there are some, there's a lot of debate about that. To what extent can you make an argument and retroject it? Um, to 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 what so that I would take issue with that um, that interpretation, but uh, so continence to celibacy around the time of the Middle Ages. So they would take issue with uh, arguments that would say, well, the Latin Church had married priests for say a thousand years and just later introduced celibacy out of the blue. I'm very happy to admit that continence and celibacy was practiced in the Latin West. The question is, the fundamental question is, was it? Uh, mm -hmm mandatory thing was it of the nature of the priesthood by its apostolic standards and that's what i would have a, a problem with uh and and actually and uh, quite worriedly I, worryingly i would argue some contemporary latin theologians um, are veering into that language um, mostly admittedly in order to safeguard the, their tradition of celibacy in view of attacks against the, the, the discipline. Um, many contemporary theologians are arguing 
theologically, and they're even using terms ontologically. I've even found a couple that use the word intrinsically, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that celibacy is associated with the priesthood. So, so I am a contradiction in sacramental <laughs> theological terms. Um, I've, I have been called by scholars who don't know me, but I've been called a bigamist. Um, so there's this inability to comprehend. And yet, traditionally, this was not an issue. Uh, I mean, before the Second Vatican Council, before Paul VI, before John Paul II, who really advanced this language, and perhaps unwittingly so, uh, definitely John Paul II, but uh, before those, uh, those events and those, those persons, um, yes, the West preferred celibacy. You know, Pius XI, I believe, called celibacy the glory of the Catholic priesthood. Um, so I guess I'm a little less less glorious, but uh, but but there was always the admittance of well the East has a different tradition, we may not like it but it's there. I mean even Thomas Aquinas was very aware of the Eastern tradition. Um, he was even a little more balanced. Um, he argues. I mean he clearly seems to really appreciate celibacy, but he often says in his Summa, well yes, and then but the East does this. And therefore, because the East does this, we can say this, this, and this. So there was, a, 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 it was sort of in the, it was in the air that the East has one tradition, the West has another tradition. And it's really only in, 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 in the last few decades in contemporary theology that there seems to be this, this, this ontological association, this in, intrinsic association. Some scholars might use that term, but a lot more used ontological. So celibacy is not, and, and the reason why they use that word is because they don't want celibacy to be merely disciplinary and therefore we can just chuck it out the window whenever we want. Um, on the other hand, by, by making that jump, mm -hmm. it's causing a lot of theological and sacramental problems when it comes to us as Eastern mm -hmm. Christians, because that tells me, and it tells everybody else, unfortunately, educates others about my priesthood, that there's something mm -hmm. wrong with my priest and there's something wrong with me which is uh we should remember not the teaching of the magisterium the mm -hmm. second Vatican council the, the canon law the catechism of the catholic church uh, all readily admit celibacy is not intrinsically uh, a part of the priesthood they actually mm -hmm. will say that um whereas I, I you know i'm a little concerned about how things are going and that's why i decided to do this again not to attack the goodness in and of itself of celibacy, but merely to to, to play that you know, that devil's advocate. No, there is another approach. Here's how we can make sense of it. I'm curious. When when do we know the last that we see married clergy in in the West? I mean, yes, maybe they they did not you know practice the marital act, but do we? When, when was the last time we seen? You know, is it 10th century, 9th century, 8th century? Well, we could talk about the naughty clerics that had concubines and wives, and of course, that was there. I mean, we could right. read. I think I may be wrong. Maybe in Chaucer, I might, but definitely in that <laughs> era. Definitely in that era, there's a lot of you know married priests with concubines and sort of naughty, right. naughty. We shouldn't be doing this, but we accept right. it's reality. Right. Uh, but uh, certainly earlier on, in the earlier centuries of the West, you do have. Um, and, and of course, I, I don't focus so much on that. There are some studies um, that that devote themselves to looking at, you know, the phenomenon of married clergy in the Latin West. Um, I focus more on the overall theological side of things. But uh, they, you know, there, there's definitely evidence of it. And the fact that the councils address it, those early local councils of the West, suggest, quite frankly, that it's happening. And that, you know, that's why they, they address it as a reaction to the problem. And you know, that's the thing about Trullo. Trullo is reacting to the West's cracking down on marriage mm -hmm. because that mm -hmm. cracking down is trickling its way to the East. That's not to say that Easterners had, they were unanimous in agreeing with married clergy. They weren't. Uh, mm -hmm. Epiphanius of Salamis, for example, um, and others you know, favored uh, single clergy. But that, again, just because one, two, and three, four fathers say that, you know, this is the case, it doesn't mean that it was what the church accepted. But there was certainly that trickling from the West's local councils into the East, causing Trullo to then react and say, well, no, we can't make such a hard and fast rule. There are 
good, you know, uh, married presbyters, but here's what they have to do in preparation for the Eucharist. Whereas in the West, the fact that these local councils were talking about it suggests that it was happening. It was happening all over the place. Um, but we, for the, as I said earlier, for the first few centuries, we don't have any legislation that really speaks of it, which, and but then again, we have, th th those early centuries are silent on many other things. We just don't have the evidence. Um, so what we really have to do is make the jump from the New Testament to the third, fourth century, mm. sort of try to figure out what happened in, so but the, here's the danger, we can't argue ex silencio, we can't argue from silence. Sure. And you kind of see how those councils are doing, they're obviously reacting, and then sort of how it goes from there, and then of course the East and West start fighting against each other. But the one thing that you do see is, um, is married clergy throughout, whether legitimately or illegitimately. And then of course, by the time the Lateran comes along, uh, you have um, uh, clerical mar marriages are declared invalid, not just illicit, invalid. And then by the time Trent comes along and establishes the seminary system, uh, there was very, you, mm. very difficult to sneak your clandestine wife into a seminary. Uh, yeah, so they, right. They're much more easily ordaining uh, celibate men to the priesthood from definitely from that time onwards. But obviously, you're not. We're not saying that it was an overnight change. There's obviously precedence happening. Um, it, it's a long, long debate and a painful one too. You mentioned there Trullo and its um, position here on celibacy. So there's been a question to what extent the West accepted the canons at Trullo, those that conflicted with Western practice, and to what extent did the West accept Nicaea's canons that accepted Trullo? And so um, is is that something that y you've you've looked into? Do we know, you know, was was this accepted in the West? These canons from Trullo and, and Nicaea that accepted Trullo. So I've looked into it just a little bit as background information, and yeah, there were many Westerners who simply didn't accept Trullo. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, um, you know, they didn't accept things in the Council that that opposed Rome. You know. But we like everything until you start opposing us and then we won't accept that. Okay, that's an understandable natural reaction. Mm -hmm. But others did. I mean, there are canonists throughout the ages that did accept Trullo. And mm -hmm. if my memory serves me correctly, uh, John Paul II, when he promulgated the Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches, said very clearly that Trullo is part of the Eastern canonical tradition. Mm -hmm. And that was enormous. And even, uh, you know, the um, canon lawyers will, will say that. That that's huge. That's that legitimizes Trullo as part of our tradition, you know. And, and that's and that's, that's yeah. in reference to Eastern Catholics, not just Eastern Orthodox, correct? Yes, indeed, in right. reference to Eastern Catholics, because part of the nineteen the formulation of the nineteen ninety code mm -hmm. was to give these Eastern Catholic bodies something that akin to what was happening in nineteen seventeen and then in nineteen eighty three with the Code of Canon Law, mm -hmm. the Peter Benedictine, and then the uh, the the. Johannine Pauline, I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that was huge because that shows that there is acceptance of the lived experience of an apostolic body. This yeah. is important. Um, you know, if, if this is the lived experience of an apostolic body, then it, it's difficult to call it unapostolic because that body is apostolic. And it always will be until the end of time, till the second coming. And so the church is able to then say, make a determination. This is by whatever, and the Vatican Council even says this, by the development of history, a different mm -hmm. development that has taken place with you than with us, the Latin church. This is part of your heritage. It's part of your expression. And, and therefore, I argue, therefore, it is apostolic just as the Latin West can be given that title because it has developed in its own unique way. And together we form the Catholic communion. I know it's a little off topic here, <laughs> kind of a rabbit trail, but could, could you briefly comment on the Eastern code of, of canon law? Because I've noticed that it, it, it's very different. At least it looks very different than Eastern Orthodox versions of canon law from the rudder. Do you know by any chance why John Paul II decided to kind of take a different route than just maybe promulgating the rudder or something like that? Well, um, so not being a canonist, I can only say, mm -hmm. so I right. the canonists to correct me. Well, we do know that 
Pius XII had begun collating various canons for the Eastern Catholic churches. And there were three documents, Clary Sanctitate, Crebre Latte, and I think there was another I can't remember, but already the process was underway. Mm. And indeed, the process sometimes involved what, what a friend of mine once called a copying and pasting job of Latin canons. But again, you got to think about it, you have 20 odd Eastern bodies, mm -hmm. got to come up with something that somehow reflects all of them and somehow allows yeah. them and take and develop their own particular law. Mm -hmm. And so the church has to really adopt a bird's eye view, kind of like what I've done with my studies. I'm not going into canonical minutiae. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm taking the plane higher. I'm elevating mm -hmm. it higher. And I'm looking down and saying, what's been going on here? What's going on? Yeah. And so it, it was, um, you know, one of the scholars that I think participated in, Father George Nedungat, Jesuit from India, um, he will even say that this this issue was you know a little bit debated, um, mm -hmm. but but in in the lived interaction with those Eastern churches, when they formulated the the code, they were able to to reflect that lived interaction, and 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 sort of set that tone. Again, it was it was not untraditional, but set the tone of how do we really understand the apostolicity. That is, that is within these vibrant Eastern bodies and how do we express that and how do we allow them to take the reins for themselves always in communion with, with the Pope of Rome, with the, with the Church of Rome, the Latin Church. So there's continuity with that. Um, but, but as I mentioned earlier, even the admission that Trullo is a part of our tradition was huge. Uh, it was an admission of, it was a great, in my opinion, a humble act to say that, yes, there have been canonists that have denied the legitimacy of Trullo, the place of Trullo, but okay, let's let's work with it. Let's understand how it fits in to the whole of the apostolic tradition and make a place for it. And that's what the Catholic Church has done brilliantly for 2000 years. Not, you know, not perfectly always, because it's, you know, hum human beings are involved. Nevertheless, the Holy Spirit evidently guiding the church to a place of tranquility and order where there can be this, this confluence, um, this, this mutuality, and this, uh, co um, I just keep thinking of the Italian word convivenza, this, mm. this, this living together. And, and that's really what I, I, I would like for my ministry to be, to show that. Well, why I'm Eastern Catholic, I want to be fully Eastern and fully in sync, in symphony with the Latin church and with her and with her genius. What's the main thesis uh, that, that you're trying to argue in your dissertation? So I'm trying to show that I, I, I think that the eventual understanding that continence is a necessary part of sacramental life, you know, it, it's a wider debate. It does have to do with, you know, how does how do marriage and sexuality find their way into the sacramental life of the church? And that it has been a thorny journey. Mm. I mean, Peter Lombard, if I remember correctly, still isn't calling marriage a sacrament before mm. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and so how marriage and sexuality, that there's a bit of a rocky road and, you know, and fathers disagreeing with themselves exactly, you know, is marriage in paradise, Augustine, or is it not? Gregory of Nyssa, mm. ironically, Western and Eastern. Um, and then how monasticism takes over and, and how those are linked. So you have this notion of asceticism and how um, and the absence of marriage and sexuality uh, somehow become associated more, more, more deeply with asceticism and therefore how the priesthood and that monasticism is lived out and then how the priesthood becomes associated with that um, and then how that sort of becomes sort of a culturally, in both the East and the West, that somehow marriage and even marital sexuality, legitimate sacramental expressions of that marriage are somehow not appropriate for the priesthood and sort of how that might lead to um, that association between continents and the priesthood. Um, so I'm showing that um, monasticism is an important prism through which this debate has to be, has to be considered, especially because it is the common institutional observance of celibacy in both the east and the west that's the common language monasticism and celibate priesthood is you know a form of monasticism it's a form of living monos uh, living by myself 
And then I, I look at, so I look at that in the first part, and then I also look at sacramentally, you know, you know, now that we know that what that impetus was for sort of that rocky reception of marriage and sexuality, how can we understand sacramentally the place of marriage uh, and even marital sexuality in view of asceticism and therefore in view of, 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 of the priesthood? You know, because really monasticism is, is, is an icon of what, from, from the Eastern perspective, what everyone is called to be. Mm. But that, that is not the same as saying everyone must be monks. Mm -hmm. Therefore, mm -hmm. I am not a monk. I am not called to be a monk, mm -hmm. strictly speaking, but I am called to live what they do, but without denaturing myself. I'm not called to denature my marriage. I'm called to live as a married man in the spirit of what those monks iconify. Um, so I'm, what I'm doing is I'm broadening the language. I'm not here to say, you know, a priest must be, again, because I'm taking what the code of the, the canon law says, and I'm here to shine in chastity. I'm not here to mimic monks. I'm here to do what they do in my way, but because my state in life is marriage. And I, you know, I, I, I refer a lot to Paul Evdokimov, who mentions that there are this, there's the same one baptismal spirituality that's refracted in two ways. You have monks living it in their way, married persons living it in their way. And a married person isn't, isn't called to be a monk to be more spiritual. A married person is called to live his or her own baptism. Um, and that's what will make them spiritual. That's what will make them saints. And therefore, I argue, priests have to, have to take their spirituality from that. So, so they're not called to be monks. They may be priest monks, <laughs> that mm -hmm. they're monks, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but they're called first and foremost to be priests. And if they're married, they're called to shine forth in, the, in their married vocation within the priesthood as a, as, a, as a symphony, as a union. Do you get the impression in this debate that many have the underlying assumption that the marital act is always sinful? I, I think there might be. Um, I've, I've certainly heard of stories. Um, mm -hmm. People will quote family members that they knew. I, I, I remember one person who happened to be Irish, and I think he said that his uh, family had grown up with a sort of a Jansenistic spirit, and, and somehow I think his grandmother or great-grandmother or something was convinced that every time she gave birth, she was committing a mortal sin. Mm. Uh, so there is that sort of that quasi-Jansenistic spirit, mm -hmm. um, which could be there. And there could be, you know, because of that, the force of that struggle uh, for chastity, there could be that lived experience of, well, there's something really, something really awkward about this. And that certainly plays into it. You know, if, mm -hmm. if I um, say as a married person uh, were to practice the marital act the night before the Eucharist, I mean, am, am I dirty? Is there mm -hmm. something wrong with me? And that certainly has been in our tradition, in both the East and the West, mm -hmm. there has been that, uh, that influence there. Whereas the church, uh, you know, thankfully does not teach that. Um, it, mm -hmm. it does teach there is a place, as St. Paul says, for mutually agreed abstinence for the purpose mm -hmm. of prayer. But that does not say it is, you know, intrinsically necessary to mm -hmm. pray. It's there as a vehicle, like fasting. It's there as a vehicle to help prayer um, just as, you know, Lent is not about necessarily fasting from food. Uh, it's about fasting from sin first. It's about using this as a tool in order to, uh, to, to rid oneself of sin and to become closer to God. The marriage and the marital act must be understood in the same way. It's part of the asceticism of the church, but it's difficult to speak ontologically. You know, this form of asceticism ontologically belongs to this vocation and that one ontologically to that one. And, and this is where I think the gift of the East comes in. The monks iconify asceticism as a whole, and everyone else sort of sees, how can I live this, what they image, what they iconify, with my spiritual father or mother, who adapts that rule to me based on my strengths, based on where I am, and I live that and I achieve my sanctity there. So this, this is the beautiful thing about, about my experience, at least, mm -hmm. as an Eastern uh, Christian and Catholic. You know, it seems like some some fathers kind of took this position. I, I think of Augustine and maybe even Gregory the Great, if I recall correctly. They kind of had this view that 
uh, concupiscence and original sin is transmitted through the marital act. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and I, I kind of wonder if that's where this notion of really pushing for this idea that you must be, uh, you, know, you, you must not be um, a married priest, you, you must be unmarried, um, it's somehow tied to the intrinsic nature of, of the um, priestly order. I kind of wonder if, if that's actually where it came from, is perhaps Augustine. Yeah, the interesting thing is Augustine was had a very positive uh, approach to the possibility of even you know marital sexuality in paradise, and yet mm -hmm. there was this tradition of concupiscence. On the mm -hmm. other hand, you have the, some Eastern fathers, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, for example, um, marriage sexuality didn't exist in paradise, and it was mm -hmm. only they were only allowed created as a consequence of the fall that, that the Lord foresaw what would happen and therefore created the division of the sexes and um, and in view of the fall. And so, yes, the, but there is this patristic struggle, this wrestling with exact this. The, and again, because the experience is so powerful, how do I deal with this drive that's inside me? Um, mm -hmm. and, and where is it going? It has to have some sort of legitimacy and the legitimacy can be expressed in a negative way and it has been in in the east and the west for example the language of uh, a, a, as a remedy for concupiscence am i denying that it's a remedy for concupiscence no uh, obviously mm. as the church says no there's a th these are the bounds in which this can be legitimately expressed but it can also be interpreted in a positive way and this is what i think we're trying to do and i think uh, the great gift of the uh, writings and teachings of john paul ii in the west Paul of Lokimov in the East and others speak to that, that there is a positive way of approaching this, that it doesn't have to be negative. So, mm. and, and, the, and, I, and I think that the theology of celibacy in the West where the priesthood actually is part of that. They're trying mm. to present celibacy in a positive way. And that's good, that's good, and I, I'm glad. And now we in the East, we're trying to now um, um, present marriage, priestly marriage, also in a positive way, without attacking the West, but to say simply, that's yes. good. It's good that you're doing that. Now this is our perspective. This is mm -hmm. what we're doing. And therefore, what we're trying to do is to say, you know, and, and I point this out in my studies, and even the East, um, you know, there, there are notions of, um, you know, women, uh, what is it, they give birth, they can't, they can't go into church for 40 days. They're somehow mm -hmm. impure, richly unclean. Like, this language um, is is unfortunate. It, it, it mm -hmm. has to be... It, it, it has very little to do with Christianity, probably nothing at all. Um, and therefore, as Christians, how do we interpret these things? Because the last time I checked, uh, our Lord took upon, fle upon uh, flesh upon himself and thereby sanctified all creation. And therefore, my body is fundamentally good. It's what I do with it. It's what comes out of the heart that disfigures it, that makes makes me sinful. Not, not the body in and of itself. Marriage mm -hmm. and sexuality have to be included in that too. Yeah, it seems like they're returning to the, the Old Testament law when they go with some of those practices on 40 days and impurity, you know, with women in their menstrual cycle or something like that. Um, you, did, did I misunderstand, but were you saying that some fathers would argue or there's a debate on whether the marital act is um, in heaven among those who have a sacramental union? Did, did I understand that correctly in my, in my way off base? <laughs> in, in, Eden, in Eden. So there was this question, you know, did okay. marriage and sexuality exist in Eden before the fall? And oh. some fathers would say no. Other I see. Yeah. In Eden, that's what you meant by paradise. Yeah. Gotcha. Got, I, I was <laughs> confusing paradise Thank you for the help scientific vision. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I take it then that, you know, when in heaven there wouldn't be such things right there between those who would have a sacramental union it, there, there there would no longer be such bodily acts i guess yes i've i've addressed this in in one part in my study where i asked you know is marriage an eschatological thing well ah. some, some people will say no because christ says in heaven they they neither marry nor are married mm -hmm. they're, they're neither married nor given given in marriage um however again returning to my experience in the divine liturgy as an eastern christian who's read people like Shmeiman and who lives mm. the text, mm -hmm. I am engaged in an eschatological act. When mm. I am celebrating the holy mysteries, I am engaging in something which is by its nature a foretaste of the eschaton. Now, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. an already but not yet. Mm -hmm. And therefore, do I necessarily cease to be married mm -hmm. when I'm there 
And the answer is absolutely not. Just as a celibate does not cease to be celibate when they are there. Mm -hmm. And that's where the fundamental complementarity comes in, is I bring that into the eschaton with me. Now, yes, it is a foreshadowing, a foretaste. It's the already but not yet. Nevertheless, it is an eschatological act. So, and this is one of the differences between a sort of a more of a scholastic Western and an Eastern approach to the sacraments. Whereas a scholastic Western might say the sacraments are uh, um, confections of grace in order to help you get to heaven. Okay. An Eastern Christian might speak differently. No, the, the, the holy sacraments are a manifestation of who we are as members of the body of Christ transformed by the Holy Spirit to become it for the, to the glory of God the Father. So it is an eschatological act in and of itself. So there is a way, I would argue, to call all the sacraments, including marriage, eschatological acts. That's not the same as saying that this is what we will do in heaven. It just means that when I, when I enter into the eschaton, I bring that which it has been blessed by the church with me. The church blesses because it's not just trying to get me into heaven. The church blesses, as an Easterner, I can say this, because it's trying to open up the portal into heaven. And therefore, what it blesses, and, and holy matrimony is one of the sa sacramental mysteries, it is blessing my marriage. And therefore, in doing so, it opens the door to heaven. And if you read the marriage, if you read the Byzantine rite of marriage, or, or just even attend it, it will not escape you. You are mm. empty into heaven right there everything about the right screams heaven and screams the eschaton and 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 i don't that was not i was not denatured from that when i became a priest i i brought it with me there's a question here for you to what extent do you think rivalry with the eastern church and later protestantism plays a part how priestly celibacy is seen in the western church there is certainly a reaction to some uh, East. And for example, the, the latest writing um, was, some of you might be familiar with um, Pope Benedict XVI and Cardinal Seurat's book, From the Depths of Our Hearts, Les Profondeurs de Nos Coeurs, where uh, Cardinal Seurat um, does, um, in, my, in my opinion, uh, rather unfortunately, speak very, um, very, in, in a sort of a, less than appreciative manner of the Eastern uh, tradition. Um, he, in, in some cases, he, he seems to be sort of angry and reacting against the East. Um, you know, the Eastern, the Eastern clergy is in crisis. Uh, mm -hmm. The only reason the Eastern clergy is accepted by the faithful is because of their monks. Otherwise, they wouldn't accept their priests. Uh, the, the only thing we should do with these Eastern married priests is to tolerate them until such time as they grow up. And, and, and accept the truth of the matter, which we hold exclusively in the Latin tradition. And yes, certainly with, with Protestants, um, they there would be a reaction to that. Uh, I think with a stricter notion that in some some Protestants might say, well, for example, a priest must be married uh, because that's what the God that's what the Bible says. He must be the husband of one wife. So therefore, he must. So therefore, a single minister is 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 not good. So, so I think that there is, I'm not saying every single Latin uh, approaches it from that, but I definitely think it does determine some responses. There, there's a question here uh, from Sean, McK Sean McKinney. How hard is it to be married and to be a pastor? <laughs> I'll answer that with a story. Uh, I was once in my, my parish office and I had had a gentleman on the line with me. He was a doctor, very busy. And he said, you know, my, my son has written off um, becoming anything to do with the medical world because I'm, I'm out all the time to 9 p.m. I, I never see him, I'm never at home. And as I looked out of my window, my office window, I saw my, there was a, another priest there and he was playing with his five-year-old son uh, in the yard in the middle of the day. Now, again, that's an accidental story. Um, a lot of it depends on what you do. I know many lay people who are far busier than pastors. I know pastors who are busier than lay people. It just, you know, I guess the, the secret in life is when do you say no and how do you mm. say no to things? Mm. Uh, but I think that there are moments when 
your ministry takes precedence, just as, say, a doctor uh, has to go on an emergency call. Somebody is dying. And, and his family, especially if they've been raised in that, they understand, okay, he has to go right now and anoint or heal someone. At the same time, it's not so bad, especially because our numbers are smaller. And, you know, we're not, we don't have, we, uh, compared with some of my Latin brother priests, we're not that busy. But, but even the Latin priests, I mean, they're not, you know, out and about 24-7 either. Um, they often seem busier because their congregations might be bigger, but they also have lay people working in parish structures as catechists, youth ministers, and so on. So it, it's, it's all about balance. I found if a priest has a good rule of prayer, he, he uh, bookends the day with prayer, um, he makes sure to set time aside for his priorities, and that includes eating well, getting exercise, spending time with family, even you know, parents or siblings, or brother, brother priests in the case of Latin priests. It's all about balance. And then emergencies do come, and when they come, we deal with them, but you know we're not we're not taking care of emergencies twenty four seven. I know some priests who do take care of them more, but they're in those mega mega Catholic churches. Yeah, but we are we are not in that position. Tell us where we can go to learn more about this, and also where we could go to find more of your content, Father. Well, I am hoping, please God, that I can publish something in in the future i'm just trying to get this done right now mm. uh, i am a pastor i'm a school chaplain i have a very large school a thousand middle schoolers um, i help my brother latin priests in their ministry i hear a lot of confessions um, right now i'm training some missionaries um, and on the side i'm doing my my studies i'm hoping eventually to uh, have this content available for people perhaps to publish um, and i i just again i want to be a part of that that uh, ecumenical uh, rapprochement between the apostolic churches of the East and the West. And we do, as Eastern Catholics, have uh, wonderful young men and women who are up and coming scholars. And so we, we really want to create a platform for them, again, because we are proud Eastern Christians and Catholics, and we wish to, to serve the church by giving our talents that what has been given to us. And so to, to create a platform for them. So any Eastern Catholic scholars out there, let's let's give the gift to the world that we've been given. Father, thank you so much for your ministry and service to the church. I really appreciate you. And I also want to thank you so much for coming on and, and having this discussion and answering my questions. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I've been here multiple times. I've enjoyed it immensely every single time. And thank you very much for your role in helping to educate uh, the rest of us as well. And I look forward to having you on soon uh, for your, your talk for the upcoming conference, which will be a dialogue between Catholics and um, Orthodox on what we need to work on for reunion. That will be June 11th, where every one of the contributors' presentations will be premiered. So y'all make sure to mark that down on your calendar, 12 p.m. Central, June 11th. So stay tuned for more. Once again, Father, thank you so much for coming on. And everybody, thank you all for watching, uh, participating there in the chat. Hit that subscribe button. Share this on your social media. Uh, all that good stuff. We'll see you later. God bless.